So hi everybody, it is great to see you again. We're gonna be doing a short video on MCQ questions on biosafety levels in bio risk management. I remain Professor Ia Izebasi, and this is the bio risk management series. If you haven't pressed that red button, <laughs> please do so. Remember, we are strong because you subscribed. Tell us what we're doing well that you like like our videos and share it to those people whom you feel would have a need to use this video. So question number one, which biosafety level is appropriate for work involving agents not known to consistently cause disease in healthy adults? A, BSL-1, B, BSL-2, C, BSL-3, and D, BSL-4. Your answer is BSL-1 because BSL-1 is used for low-risk microbes that pose minimal potential threat, like your E. coli K12. Question number two. Which of the following agents will typically require a BSL-4 containment? Remember that that is the highest risk level. And we have A, Salmonella enterica, B, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, C, Ebola virus, D, Staphylococcus aureus. Remember, if you're writing these, please make them italicized, okay? Your answer is C, Ebola virus. And this is because BSL-4 is reserved for high-risk agents like Ebola virus that can cause fatal diseases with no known treatments of vaccines. So you don't even want to let them out. Question number three. Which biosafety level requires the use of full body air supplied positive pressure suit? BSL-1, BSL-2, BSL-3, BSL-4. Your answer is BSL-4 because personnel that work in BSL-4 must use maximum containment gear, including a pressurized suit, because you don't want to be exposed to any organism that is in this class. Okay, biosafety class. So question number four, which of these features is not typically associated with BSL-2 laboratories? We have use of class two biosafety cabinets, B, controlled access to the lab, C, full body positive pressure suits, D, use of autoclaves for decontamination. Our answer is C, full body positive pressure suits. We only need those in BSL-4. For BSL-2, you only use lab coats and gloves. Which, question number five, which BSL is appropriate for work? Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Please, if you are writing any of these um, agents, make sure they are italicized. You have A, BSL-1, then BSL-2, BSL-3, BSL-4. Your answer is BSL-3 because mycobacterium tuberculosis is airborne and potentially lethal. So your BSL-3 containment is required. Which of these practices is mandatory across all biosafety levels? You have the use of HEPA filters, use of biosafety cabinet, proper hand hygiene, and full body suits, all right? So the practice that is mandatory across all biosafety level is your proper hand hygiene because it's a universal requirement across all the biosafety levels. Question seven, what is the main goal of bio risk management in relation to biosafety levels? You have A, reducing laboratory output, B, ensuring scientific applications, C, preventing accidental exposure and release of hazardous agents. D, increasing laboratory funding. So your answer is C, because the aim of virus management is to control risk through preventing as well as protective measures. Question number eight, which biosafety level usually includes directional airflow? That is airflow into the lab, but not out of the lab. You have BSL-1, BSL-2, BSL-3, BSL-4. Your answer is BSL-3 because in BSL-3, directional F is key so as to be able to contain pathogens. So the air flows into the lab, but not out of the lab, so that the pathogens don't get the air out of the lab. Question number nine says, what feature is unique to BSL-4 laboratories compared to other levels? 
um, A, access to autoclaves, B, biohazard signage, C, building is a separate facility or completely isolated zone, D, lab coats and gloves. Your answer is C, the building has to be a separate facility or completely isolated zone because BSL-4 labs are designed for maximum containment and isolation. Remember that the organisms found in these biosafety levels are very dangerous and for most of them, we do not have a cure. Question number 10, what is the most common route of infection in a laboratory setting? A, you have injection, B, skin puncture, C, inhalation, D, eye contact. Your answer will be inhalation because many laboratory acquired infections are usually caused by aerosolized agents. Question number 11. Which of the following is considered a primary barrier to biosafety? You have your autoclave, your lab coat, your biosafety cabinet, as well as your laboratory building design. Your answer will be biosafety cabinet because the primary barriers directly contain the agent. You know? So the biosafety a cabinet is an example of a primary barrier because it directly contains the agent. Question number 12, which biosafety level typically allows work on open bench tops with standard microbiological practices? You have BSL-1, BSL-2, BSL-3, BSL-4. Your answer is BSL-1 because you with BSL-1, you could work on open bench minimal safety practices because these are low risk agents. They usually will not cause disease like your E. coli K12. Uh, question number 13, which of these is a common example of a PSL2 pathogens? I have told you, if you are writing this, please make sure the names are italicized. Forgive me for not italicizing these names. So you have A, Bacillus subtilis, B, HIV, I hope you know the full name, HIV, a smallpox virus and Ebola virus. Your answer is HIV. HIV is actually handled under BSL-2 with added precaution for blood pathogens. Question number 14. Which component is critical for preventing release of infectious aerosols in BSL-3 labs? So you have A, standard airflow, B, Positive pressure rooms, C, negative pressure ventilation, D, unsealed windows, and your answer is C, negative pressure ventilation. Why is that necessary? Negative pressure usually prevents contaminated air from escaping into the environment. So air flows, that's why it's called directional air flows into the lab, but does not flow out of the lab, all right? Uh, question number 15, which type of research is most likely to require BSL-4 condition? A, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, B, culturing skin flora, C, viral hemorrhagic fever studies, D, routine TB diagnosis. Your answer will be C, viral hemorrhagic fever studies because most of these studies will involve deadly viruses, no treatments, requiring BSL-4. Don't want to mess with those guys. Like during the lecture, check out my video on that. You will find out that the BSL-4, uh, the agents under the BSL-4 are the big boys, and there is usually no treatment for them. Okay, so question number 16, I hope. In BSL-2 labs, which of the following is an important secondary barrier? You have A, hand washing, sharp disposal, C, restricted access, D, use of Bunsen burners. Your answer, your answer will be C, restricted access, because secondary barrier include facility-based controls like limited lab access. Remember the other question we did? We talked about primary barriers. That is those barriers that you know, primarily contain the agent itself. The secondary barriers are facility-based controls like limiting lab access and uh, all that. 
So please take a look at my video on biosafety levels. <clears throat> you will see um, a lecture on all this, and it's quite interesting, you know. So um, question number 17, which of the following is not a principle of bio-risk management? We have A, mitigation, B, assessment, C, overexposure, D, performance. And our answer is C, overexposure, because overexposure is a risk you want to avoid. It's not a principle of managing risk. Mitigation is there. Assessment is there. If you remember your AMP model, assessment, mitigation, and performance. But exposure is not a principle, and it is what it is a risk that you want to avoid. Question number eighteen: Which biosafety level requires medical surveillance of personnel? You have BSL one, BSL two, BSL three, BSL four. Your answer will be BSL-4 because of the high risk associated with the organisms that are in that biosafety level. So BSL-4 workers will often have to undergo medical screening and monitoring to make sure that, number one, they are not infected, and number two, they do not take that infection out to the community. Question number 19, what is the first step in the risk management process? You have monitoring, you have mitigation, you have risk assessment, and you have incident response. Your answer will be C, risk assessment. Why is that the first step? It's because risk assessment helps you to identify and evaluate hazards so that you can make appropriate decision on the control strategies that you want to take. All right, question number 20, which term best describes the combined application of biosafety and biosecurity principles? A, lab management, B, virus management, C, infection control, and D, sterilization. I'm sure everybody wants to answer this. The answer is bio-risk management because bio-risk management integrates both biosafety, the measures, as well as biosecurity measures. Remember that biosafety has to do with accidental release of the organisms, while biosecurity has to deal with intentional misuse of those organisms. Having come to the end, I want to say, well done. And I wish you all best in exams. Take care and ta-da.